All right, we're ready for Acts 20 and 21 of the book of Acts. And so we have some ground to cover. If we're going to cover those two chapters, we're going to hit the high point, which all we all we have time to do. So let's see where that sets. This is our outline of the book of Acts. We are in the second of those sections where the gospel is going to the uttermost parts of the world. And we are in the section that deals with finishing that third uh, missionary journey and starting Paul's trials and journey to Rome. He'll be arrested in our study today and he's going to be in prison and be held captive until the book ends as we come to that a little bit later. Now, for those of the great ages, if you're uh, drawing on your map, you have a blank map as one of your uh, things on your handout. Uh, you don't have this part on there. You had it from last week, but if you want to catch up, let's get Paul from Antioch of Syria, his home base, and he went back through the places like Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch and made his way over to Ephesus. And in Acts 19, was, he was at Ephesus. And that's where we left off. And so draw your, your line. We're going to come back and finish this. Uh, in fact, when we get through today, we finished all of this line back down to Jerusalem. And that's where he's going to be taken when he's arrested. But we left him in Ephesus last time. And so we're ready for Acts chapter 20. So in Acts chapter 20, things happen here. This chapter, as I've entitled it, is simply dealing with in Macedonia. He goes to work in Macedonia and in Greece. And there is the worship at Troas. And then there is a visit with the Ephesian elders. I want to give some attention to that visit with the Ephesian elders. It's very practical and some very fundamental things to learn from that. So we're going to kind of quickly go through the first six verses. So uh, we're ready in the first six verses, Paul's second visit to Macedonia. Remember, he'd been there in the second missionary journey. This is the third and so this is his second visit to Macedonia in Greece. So what he does there, we're fixing to map that out in a moment. When he goes into Macedonia, he encourages the brethren in Macedonia. He spends three months in Greece, down at Athens and Corinth. And then he travels back through Macedonia and sails to Troas. So let's get this caught up on the map now. Uh, we, we left him at Ephesus, where we left him in Acts 19. And so what we're doing now is he's making his way up through Troas up to Philippi, over to Thessalonica, to Berea, that is, into Macedonia, places he's been before. And then he makes his way down to Greece. That would have reference to Achaia, which includes Athens, and over to Corinth. And so that's where we, we have him. Now, let's go back um, to our outline here, and let's work through verses 1 to 6. Time to make comments on everything, but I do want you to uh, draw, draw some attention to some things that I mentioned here is mentioned in 2 Corinthians, and if you have the PDF material, I encourage you to go to that and take note of that. So after the uproar, Paul called the disciples, and he embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. So uh, he was ready to leave Ephesus, go up through Troas and over to Macedonia. Um, and when he had gone over the region, he encouraged the brethren with many words, and he came to Greece. So it doesn't really tell us all that he did other than encouraging the brethren there at Ephesus. He encouraged the brethren in Macedonia. And then he made his way on down to Greece. Now, just a footnote, and this is in your PDF material if you've downloaded that off of the website. Uh, and that is in 2 Corinthians, what we, we see that at this point, at verse 1, it's at this point where Paul left Ephesus and went to Troas and waited on Titus. That's how we know he went to Troas. And you say, well, he didn't mention he went to Troas. But it does in 2 Corinthians uh, that he waited in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians he waited on Titus to hear the report of how the first letter to the Corinthians was received. He was concerned about that. It was a stern letter. He rebuked them about a number of things. How was that letter going to be received? Well, Titus was delayed and didn't show. So he goes on into Macedonia, and Titus finally came to Philippi and brought news about the first letter. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and 2 Corinthians chapter 7 give us all that information. And again, that's in the PDF if you go download that off of our website. So Paul sent 2 Corinthians, immediately sets down at this juncture, and sends 2 Corinthians off by Titus, and uh, 2 Corinthians 8 gives us that information. So he sends that by Titus, and concerned about the church there at Corinth. But that's all taking place at this juncture. Not mentioned here, we gather that information from 2 Corinthians. Uh, so now... Um, we might make a note that if you're keeping up in the margin of your text, where certain books are written, 2 Corinthians was written from Macedonia, about 56 A.D. 
uh, when he gets to Corinth, which is he's there, verse 3, and uh, verse 2 and 3, he would have written Romans and he would have written Galatians about 57 A.D. So this is the time frame where certain letters are being written. Thessalonians has already been written, though they, it appears later in the canon. Uh, we have uh, 2 Corinthians being written before Romans and in Galatians. So they're not put in order of their, their writing, uh, but this gives us a little time frame of their writing. Now, he spent three months in Greece, and then he traveled back through Macedonia, the text said, and according to verse 3, uh, decided to return, he travels back through Macedonia to Troas. Uh, so we, we got him up to, to, uh, to Greece, and then he makes his way back, so fit, fill in your mouth. Uh, the, the line I just added there from Corinth, going back through Macedonia and back on over to Troas. So we're backtracking and we're coming back to Troas. That's where we are now. So now let's get to verse 7 and let's talk about the Lord's Day meeting at uh, Troas. Now there's more information about some of the, the contribution. We don't have time to go into uh, that, uh, the contribution for the poor saints at Jerusalem that we'll talk about from verse uh, uh, we could talk about from verse 6, some of these messengers were, were on their way to Jerusalem to take the, poor, uh, the collection for the poor saints. All right, now let's talk about this, this Lord's Day meeting at Troas at uh, verses 7 through 12. Now, first of all, we, we notice at verse 7, they observed the Lord's Supper. On the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. And then talk, the text says, Paul preached unto them. And then we see Eutychus falling out of the window and uh, was taken up dead and he was raised from the dead. Now, let's get verse 7, the observance of the Supper. Uh, I'll list in the material that uh, you can load principles there about the significance of this day is the fact that you already know that Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day. That's the significance of this being the day of worship. Secondly, 1 Corinthians 16 suggests to us or tells us that the church regularly met on the first day of the week, on the uh, that they were to lay by and store up on the first day of every week, the text says. So that was a regular practice of the early church to meet every first day of the week. And the church was established on the first day of the week in Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost fell on that day. So that's the significance of that day. Secondly, the term breaking bread here refers to the Lord's Supper. Sometimes that can be used with reference as per the context later of, uh, of eating common food. Common meal can be called breaking of bread. But this was in the context of a worship assembly because Paul is preaching unto them, which tells us that as we harmonize it with 1 Corinthians 11, this is observance of the Lord. That's how that's used um, in places like um, Matthew 26 and Mark 14, etc. Uh, thirdly, this is the only passage that tells us about the day of observance of the Lord's Supper. The, uh, there is in 1 Corinthians uh, 11, there is in Ma Matthew 26, Luke 22, uh, passages like that that deal with the Lord's Supper. There's not a reference in any of those about the day it's to be observed. The only information we have about that is in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. And it is not a command, it's an approved example. Now how do I know it's an approved example? Because in the midst of this, Eutychus fell out the window and a miracle was performed showing God's approval of the things that were taking place there at Troas here in the upper room. Now, uh, the fourth thing is, this passage infers the Lord's Supper is to be observed every first day of the week, just like remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And I know we could develop that even further. Uh, but then you might make a marginal note that this uh, was, um, was Roman time and not Jewish time. And there's been much said about that, that Paul was probably talking about Jewish time, which means that basically the Lord's Supper would have been taken uh, on a Saturday night instead of on the first day of the week uh, because Jewish time was from sunset to sunset and Roman time was from midnight to midnight. But as we go further in the context, you see, and I give evidence of that in the material, that Paul left on the day after daylight, but if this was Jewish time, he would have been leaving the same day. It would not have been the next day at all. So this had to be Roman time as per ver uh, the context of verses 7 through 11. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, Paul preached to him on that occasion, we'll say a great deal about that. Verses 8 through 10, Eutychus fell from the third story and it killed him and then he was raised up from the dead to give God's approval. God gave his hand of approval upon the events that took there at Troy. 
Now let's go further because I'm interested in getting on down to the elders' discussion of the visit with the elders in verse, uh, later beginning at verse 17. So we're going from Troas to Miletus now in 13 to 16. And uh, so let's get him from uh, Troas. We've left him up here at Troas and we're going to bring him down to Miletus. So uh, watch on the screen there, Grady Dages, and you're going to go from Troas down to Miletus, just on the seaport, just away from Ephesus. Paul did not have time to go all the way into Ephesus and spend any time there, so he called for the elders of the church to come down to him. Now, we're not going to make much comment about uh, verses 13 to 16. Uh, it just gives us some details of Paul going on so far by foot, and uh, they picked up Paul and... Um, the next day they came to Miletus and Paul decided to sail past Ephesus and because he was in a hurry, the text says he's trying to get to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. I'm interested in getting to this section and we want to spend a little time here about Paul talking with the Ephesian elders at Miletus. So he called for the elders of the church at Ephesus and here, there are four things that we, we see here. First of all, he reviewed his past work. We'll talk about that. There's the anticipation of the trip to Jerusalem and then there's the charge and warning. Then actually he talks to them about three things, and then the text says he departed. So let's talk about the three things he talked to them about. He reviewed his past work. Uh, what did he say about reviewing his uh, past work? 17 through verse 21. There are three things that he said about that. 17 to 19, first of all, he said he served the Lord with humility and in tears and in, tri and in trials. That you know at verse 18 that from the first day that I came to you, the manner I've always lived among you. And so he mentions the fact that uh, he had led a consistent life, how I've always lived. It wasn't that he at times had lived right and then times he fell away and then he, and he lived right and he fell and he came back. Uh, but he had been consistent in his living. You know the manner of life that I've, I have always had among you. He mentions in that context of uh, verse 19, that he served the Lord with all humility and many tears and trials. I, you know what I endured, and you knew the humility that I had. The review of the past work that I had uh, with you, that you know that I've served the Lord with humility and tears and trying. Now, notice it, verses 20 and 21. I kept back nothing but taught you the whole counsel of God. So there's a couple of places, and I know grouping verses together. Look at 20 and 21. That uh, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed you and taught you publicly and from house to house. So when I was there at, at Ephesus, I was teaching you. I taught publicly in the assemblies. I taught publicly in the town. I taught from house to house privately. He was preaching to Jews and Greeks, verse 21. Let's drop down to verse 26 and 27, that therefore I testify that I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Now, why would he say I'm innocent? I, that I bear no responsibility for anyone being misled, and I bear no responsibility for anyone not being informed. Why? Because I did not shun to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Uh, that's an important, you might underline that phrase. We, we need the whole counsel of God. What does that mean? Uh, if we were conducting this as a typical Bible class, I'd open that up and we'd develop that for a little while. But the whole counsel of God means there, there's no part of it that, that's off limits. So there's first principles that need to be taught, but you also teach some meteor things. There are things that are going to not settle well with people, that needs to be preached. Things that are going to ruffle feathers, that needs to be preached. Things that they don't like, that needs to be preached. The whole counsel, the whole spectrum of the message. There's no aspect of it that you back off from. You give them all that they need. And so that's exactly what he did. I kept back nothing. So here's the kind of work I've been doing among you. Now, verses 33 to 35, I know we're skipping some verses. I'm trying to group some things together. This is still a part of his past work. I provided for myself working and talking uh, that you should support the weak. Notice beginning at verse 33. I didn't covet anyone's uh, silver or gold or apparel. In other words, I didn't come working and just trying to, to gain financially from you. And yes, you yourselves know that with these hands are provided for my necessities. I was willing to work to do service. I was willing to work with my hands and making tents so that I could do the work of the Lord. So I wasn't interested merely in material things. And yes, Five, I've shown you that in every way by this, you should the weak. And then he quotes from the Lord, which is only quoted here, not found in any of the Gospels, where the Lord had said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. 
There's a greater blessing in giving to others than in receiving. So he said, I taught you some things. So here's the kind of past that I've had with you. You know the past life that I've lived, the consistent life. I kept nothing back. I provided for myself, showing you my real interest was in the gospel, and I taught you how to support those that are weak. Now, let's start at verse 22. There's the anticipated trip to Jerusalem. And so he tells the elders, whom he loved dearly, that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He said he was going to go and he would be bound. Look at verse 22. That I go in the, in the spirit to Jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there. In other words, when I get to Jerusalem, I'm not sure what I was going to happen, but I do know this. Verse 23. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying in every city that... So here's what I've been told. has been revealed by the Spirit of God that when I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be bound and I'm going to be under trial. I know that much, but I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know the full, the full picture. So change and tribulations await me. Verse 24, Paul's not moved at all. That he said, none of those things do to me, nor do I count myself, my life dear to myself, uh, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, I know I'm going, I don't know what's, I'm going to face tribulation. I'm going to be arrested. But that doesn't move me. I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. So my whole motive is I plan to preach the gospel in spite of that. Now verse 5. That indeed, now I know that, um, let me start over. lost my place. Verse 25. And indeed now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. In other words, I'm sure that when I go to Jerusalem, You'll never see me again. I'll not be back this way again. And, constantly, and there's going to be something said about that toward the end at verses 36, 37, and 38. So here's my anticipated trip to Jerusalem. So because that principle is true, this is why he talks about this second year, 28, 32. Here's a charge and a warning to the elders. Now what does he say to them? Well, look at verse 28. Verse 28, here's the first thing he says to them. He tells him three things. Number one, take heed to, she uh, to and shepherd the flock of God. Take heed to yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit had made them overseers to shepherd the church of God which is purchased with his own blood. Now two or three things uh, that we might observe about verse 28. <clears throat> one is um, that they were appointed by the Holy Spirit. How were they appointed by the Holy Spirit? It's not the, uh, the Holy Spirit arbitrarily. I want you to be an elder, you to be an elder, and you to be an elder. But by the Holy Spirit revealing the qualifications, and when men meet those qualifications, per 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, then the Holy Spirit has appointed them. The Holy Spirit's appointing elders today. How so? Same way. Revealing the qualifications, and then appointing men in harmony with those qualifications. So the Holy Spirit appointed them, and notice he says that they should shepherd and oversee the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So there's two things that should give these elders uh, some sense of a sober responsibility. Number one, the Holy Spirit made you overseers, number one. And number two, you're overseeing a church that was purchased with the blood of Christ. Now you stop and think about that. What if somebody handed you some, some valuable piece of, uh, of crystal? that had sold at some great auction and, and they said this thing has it just brought five million dollars and here you take care of that and hold it till we come back and get it and you're in charge of that and you think man a lot of money was paid for this thing this is very valuable I, I, I don't know if I want the responsibility but you think of handling the church and the price was paid was not five million dollars it was the blood of Jesus Christ and what a grave responsibility that he uh, put upon these elders. Now, here's what else he says about that. Verses 29 to 30, or through 31, apostasy. And so consequently, it's coming from among you, he says. Let's get the picture. That after my departure, savage wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. Elders always need to be aware of that. That's part of the work. Let's footnote here. Elders' job as elders is not primarily being checkbook elders. This, again, typical Bible class, I would ask, what, what, what does that mean? Some have the idea that checkbook elders are, are, are that elders are just checkbook elders, meaning they oversee the finances. 
and they make decisions. Here's how much money we're going to spend here. Here's, here's we're going to make this purchase, and uh, um, we're going to put new carpet down, and we're going to the uh, parking lot paved. Those checkbook decisions. That's not their main job. In fact, that's not even uh, doesn't even rise to the top of their responsibility. Their responsibility is watching for the souls of men. And so he says there's going to be departures to come. Verse 20, verse 20, that among your own selves, even within the elders, drawing away disciples after themselves. So part of watching for apostasy is not always looking outside, that is to the world and to the denominations and to uh, foreign religions, that they may come in and be devastating, but watch from even among your own selves men arising. Wise elders will watch for things surfing, th uh, surfacing from within, within the local church, wherein things begin to be taught that are contrary to the scriptures. That's what They'll draw away disciples after themselves. And here's what needs to be done. Watch and remember that I did not cease to warn you night and day with tears. Elders need to be warned. Elders need to be warned and elders need to warn. Now then finally, verse 32, I know that's a quick and hurried look at that, verse 32, I commend you to the word of his grace, able to build you up and give you an inheritance. Where's the answer going to be found to all these dangers? And that is, he said, I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. You take the word of his grace. Now notice he called that the gospel of the grace of God at verse 24, same, same reference. Might make a draw a line between verse 32 and verse 24, the gospel of the grace of God and the word of his grace is the same message. And it's the same thing as the whole council and the same thing as preaching the kingdom. Those four references found right there in that text. So here's what he said to the elders. Here's my past work. You know well what I've done. Here's my anticipated trip and I don't think I'll see you again. And so consequently, I want to give you a warning. Apostasy is coming. Beware and you take heed your own selves. And so here's the answer. You keep pointing to the word of his grace, and that'll build you and the church up. Now let's get 36 to 38 quickly, and then we'll wrap chapter 20 up. That verse 20, uh, verse 36, that after he'd said these things, they, uh, they knelt down and they prayed. He prayed with them all, and they wept freely and fell on Paul's neck, and they kissed him, and they sorrowed most because he had said he, they would see his face no more. And you think of what a, a somber occasion that must have been as uh, Paul makes his way and leaves from these elders whom he loved dearly. But that was his speech to the, to the Ephesian elders. Now let's go to Acts 21 now. Acts 21 is ending the third journey, and we're going then to the final section of the book, and that is Paul being arrested in his trials, which start in Acts 21. Now, so if we have two things. We go from Miletus to Jerusalem, verses 1 to 17, and then Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. So let's get him to Jerusalem here. And then we'll come back to this outline. So we've left him at Miletus. So your map should start here at Antioch, make its way all the way through Macedonia and came back to Troas and down to Miletus. That's where we left him. So now we're just going to finish this trip and we're going to come down through by, by Cyprus. These cities, Kos and Patara are mentioned. Comes on down to Tyre and uh, to Ptolemus and to Caesarea and then to Jerusalem. And that's where he's going to be arrested. So finish that map. We'll do that again, going from Miletus, making your way all the way down to Tyre, to Ptolemus and Caesarea, and then to Jerusalem. And that's the completion of the third missionary journey. That's all the three missionary journeys. All right, let's go back now to our outline, and let's see what happens. He sailed from Miletus to Tyre. Uh, we're not going to have time to develop much of that. Verses 4 to 6, they spent seven days at Tyre with disciples. Um, and so these are some disciples that have been converted previously. Uh, we're not sure exactly from, from whence they may have uh, been converted, but may have been some from Phoenicia in Acts chapter 11 and in verse 19, maybe where they came from, of how the gospel got there. Then he came to Caesar, stayed with Philip. Now it's interesting to notice about Philip. I wish we had time to say more about Philip. This is Philip the evangelist that did preaching in Acts 8. Same guy. But what's mentioned here was something about his family, that uh, he had four da virgin daughters who prophesied. Now that tells you he raised four children, these, at, least, at least four children. He had four daughters. They were all virgins. He taught them moral purity. They maintained moral purity. 
And he taught them about spirituality because they all prophesied. That says a great deal about Philip as a family man. Philip is a man who trusted in God and all those expressions uh, that were said about him over in Acts chapter 6, if you recall uh, a little bit earlier. Um, the prophet Agabus, verses 10 and 11, came and foretold of Paul's arrest. Remember, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands up to symbolize the man who owns this belt will go bound to Jerusalem. And, uh, and so he will be bound. So the prophet Agabus, we saw him earlier uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, he, he foretold of that arrest. And so Paul was determined to go anyway. Notice at verse 12, this is quite interesting to me, um, that uh, when the brethren heard these things, they pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. And Paul said, what, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? Now that's an interesting phrase. Well, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? In other words, uh, they were weakening Paul's determination to go on with his duty, as Robertson translates that. Uh, that I'm determined to go do what I need to do. I'm determined to go do the will of God. I'm, I'm determined to go do what I'm supposed to be doing. And you, you're, you're, you're making it hard for me. And so when they heard that, they ceased and they began to say, the will of the Lord be done. But I want to back up just for a moment um, that the text says, uh, <clears throat> do, 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 uh, I'll come back to my, my phrase um, that I'm looking for in, in a moment. I'll come back to that. Let's go now to verse um, 15. Paul finally makes his way to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, uh, let's start at verse 18 now. And um, let's talk about Paul going before the elders. I know we're battling kind of the clock. I want to get to, to some things that take place here. Um, beginning at verse 18 now, <clears throat> Paul goes to Jerusalem <clears throat> and received him gladly. Um, and on the day following, Paul went into James and all the other elders were present. And uh, when they greeted him, <clears throat> notice at verse 19, <clears throat> we're going to follow these four points here. Paul reported his work among the Gentiles. In other words, he's been telling about his three missionary uh, journeys. I've been to the Gentiles in, in the first missionary journey, went back in the second missionary journey. I just finished the third missionary journey. I'm just coming off of that. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing what he must have said. And I've been among the Gentiles. All right. And um, he, he told them the details of the things which God had done through his ministry. Now, verse 20 to 22, James elders warned about the results of false rumors about him. What, what had been said? Well, let's see what verse 20. You see, brother, how that many myr uh, myriads of Jews there are who have believed. In other words, you've converted a bunch of Jews. Our Jews have been converted, and they're zealous for the law. That doesn't mean Jews. I don't think this phrase means that Jews that have been, who have believed are zealous for keeping the law but they're zealous about the customs of the law. And we're going to see that. And this is an important distinction to be made. Verse 21, they have been formed that you teach among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and that you ought not to circumcise their children nor walk according to the customs. You might underline or circle the word customs. We're going to make a point about that in a moment. So here's the rumor. You've come to Jerusalem and, and these Jews around here have been hearing this rumor that you're going and telling people who are Jews, don't keep the customs of the Jews. Don't allow your children to be circumcised. Don't uh, uh, eat certain kinds of food like the custom of the Jews are. You, you just for, for, forget all of that. You, just, you don't keep any of the customs. And he said, that's what's been told about you. And they're, they're going to hear about that. Now beginning at verse 20, and then verse 22, what then the assembly must certainly meet and they will hear uh, that you have come. So the Jews are going to be and when the word gets out, they're going to know you're here in Jerusalem. So we need to do some, some, of, the, some of this rumor. So here's what needs to be done. James and the elders, verse 23 and 24, suggested take four men and observe the Jewish customs to prove the rumor is false. So he might make a margin. Of, going to go to, Paul is going to go to the temple to show that customs are right. It's all right to keep these customs. And that the rumor that has been told is false. 
So they say take four men. And take them uh, when they're purified, pay their, their expenses. It seems to be the Nazarite vow, custom among the of which they were informed concerning, you are nothing, that you yourself walk according, uh, walk according to the word law. And draw a line back to customs of verse 21. That's what you're going to demonstrate, Paul, is that you are willing to keep the law. Now, Paul had been preaching we ought not to keep the law. I don't think he's contradicting himself. Nor are these Jews, nor are these elders telling him what you do is contradict yourself, contradict yourself and, and um, do uh, uh, something different. That's not the point. It has to do with the customs. That's how, the sense in which the law. You keep the law in the sense you, you kept the customs of the law. So in other words, let's just stop, pause just for a moment. There was nothing wrong with being circumcised because Jews were circumcised. It just wasn't a condition of salvation. So if a Jew wanted to keep being circumcised because Jews had always been circumcised, they had every right to do that. Remember, he took Timothy and had him circumcised. Remember that? So that was okay to do that, to keep the customs of the law. And it was all right to abstain from eating of, of certain kinds of meats because it was associated with being unclean. So I can't eat that. Any. I just don't think I ought to eat that because Jews just never have eat pork. And so there's nothing wrong with abstaining from pork. Those are customs of the law. But to bind that as law was a different matter. And so that's the point that's being made here in this context. But now concerning the Gentiles, I'm going to paraphrase verse 25 in interest of time. Verse 25, what he says, they simply restated what that was not to be bound upon the Gentiles. In other words, the same, we still stand by, James is saying, we still stand by what was emphasized at that Jerusalem discussion in Acts 15. That you can't take circumcision and bind it upon the Jews. You can't take other principles and bind it upon the Jew, upon the Gentiles, that is. You can't bind any of that upon them. We still stand by the principles of Acts 15. That's what he's saying. So Paul goes before James and the elders, and here's what they suggest that he do. All right, now Paul, verse 26, went to the temple. Now let's notice at verse 26 what he did. Paul went into the temple. And when seven days were already ended, the Jews of Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred the whole crowd into sin. You know, the days of purification. So he did exactly what, um, what was suggested that he do. What's the point? The point of that is that he's trying to put his money where his mouth is, as we noticed in the PDF material. Like Jeremiah bought the field or Ezra refusing an escort in Ezra 8. In other words, he's putting his money where his mouth is. He's been telling people it's okay to keep the customs, but it's not binding as law. And so what's he doing? He's putting his money where his mouth is. He's showing, uh, showing his belief. He didn't just talk, talk about what he believed, but he put, he, he put demonstrating where he stands. Now let's get 27 to 32. There's an uproar about this. So Paul is accused of teaching against the law and the Gentiles, taking Gentiles into the temple. This is, this is the occasion of his arrest. So when the seven days were ended, they saw him in the temple and they stirred up the whole crowd, saying, and teaches all men everywhere against the law and against the place. And he's brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled the holy place. Now on what basis had they, had, had they concluded that he had defiled the temple with a Greek? Well, they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, it, with him in the city, and he, they saw Paul in the temple, and they put two and two together, and they assumed that he had taken Trophimus into the temple. Aren't a lot of rumors the same way where somebody sees this little bit of information, they see another bit of information, they put two and two together, there's something missing, and they add the, the uh, rest of the information they think ought to be there, and up with a conclusion that's unfounded. And that's what they did with Paul. And so they accused him of bringing a Gentile in the temple. So notice at verse 30 to 32 now, 30 to 32, that all the city was disturbed and Paul was dragged out of the temple and uh, they were seeking to kill him. And when the commander of the garrison heard about that, he immediately took soldiers and went down and stopped the beating of Paul. So what did they do with Paul? They beat him. 
So they, they, they were wanting to kill him. So who is this commander? Well, we're not told here, but let me give you a reference or two. Acts 23, verse 26, and Acts 24, verse 7 and 22. I'll give those again. The commander is Claudius Lysias. That's who this is. Not identified here. He's going to be identified two chapters later. Acts 23, and in verse 26, and Acts 24, verse 7, and Acts 24, verse 22. Those three verses. Claudius Lysias. That's who this is. He puts a stop to it. And takes Paul to the barracks. And notice at verse now, verses 33 to 36, he's rested now. He's taken to the barracks. And he asks Paul, what have you done? It seems to be, in my mind, based on what else we see about Claudius Lysias, a sincere question of tell me what you, you have done. Now, why, why do I think that's a, a genuine inquiry? Well, he seems to be searching because he later... Uh, is willing to give up his assumption about Paul, and he later gives Paul permission to speak, verse 40, here in this, all that in the same context. So it seems to be a genuine inquiry. What, if, what is it that they're accusing you of? What is it that you have done? Tell me what the problem is. Now, at verse um, 35, when he reached the stairs to be carried by the soldiers, because, and, and he had been carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob and the multitude of people of crying out away with him. As Paul was about to enter into the barracks beginning at verse 37. Now let's finish this section up and, and our time uh, will be on 37 to 40. Paul is asking permission to speak. He said, may I speak to you? Well, can you speak Greek? Well, now notice at verse 37, I mean verse 38. You want to know, are you that Egyptian? that some time ago raised an insurrection and led 4,000 assassins into the wilderness. And um, some years before, there was an Egyptian that led some 4,000 into the wilderness and had claimed that the walls of Jerusalem were going to fall like the walls of Jericho and uh, had misled people. And he assumed perhaps Paul might be that Egyptian that did that. And Paul said, no, he wasn't. He said, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, citizen by a mean city, and I implore you to permit me to speak to the people and so when he was given permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned for the people to be silent, and then he spoke to them in the Hebrew tongue. Now, two things we're going to mention in our time's gone. One is, why did he speak to them in a Hebrew tongue? He could speak Greek, but he spoke in a Hebrew tongue. It, speaking in a Hebrew tongue, he captured the attention of his audience. Let's get ahead of ourselves. Notice at verse 2 of the next chapter, when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew tongue, they kept all silent. He wants to capture their attention. He could have spoke to them in Greek. He speaks Greek, but he spoke to them in a Hebrew tongue. He captured their attention. The second thing is what did he say? Well, that's what Acts 22 is about. Acts 22, we simply call Paul's defense. Standing on the stairs and the mob is before him. There are Jews all around. False accusations have been made. This is his defense, and he's going to tell about his conversion in Acts 22. And so we're going to stop at that, that juncture. And we're ready then for Acts 22 next time.